Yeah, thanks very much for uh, inviting me here. I'm, this is my, my fourth time in Zagreb, and this is the happiest uh, occasion for coming to Zagreb. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I worked in working cooperatives almost all my adult life, uh, mostly in one, in Suma. As Drajan explained, Suma is the the biggest worker cooperative in the UK, and just have a look at suma.corp, um, and it's been in existence 40 years, and it has some great features, Suma, and it has some not good things going on. Um, I'll just explain Suma for it to start off with because uh, it's a great example. Uh, I've also been uh, a Labour Party politician, um, and I was a city councillor in Bradford, the city of Bradford in the north of England for 12 years. And I've also represented UK worker cooperatives at the European Federation, CCOP, in Brussels. And, uh, Eric, Eric, yeah, Eric was there uh, before me, so we've just discovered that tonight. So the year Eric left, I joined, so we didn't meet. So I have a, an understanding of worker cooperatives from a, around the world as well. And there were lots of clashes all the way through my career between organised labour and unions and workers' control, worker cooperatives. And only in, in, in the UK, only in the last two years, have the unions and cooperatives made friends. And that's crazy, because they've been suspicious of each other and sometimes enemies for, oh, I think since 1880. So possibly uh, you know, a, a long time, you know, 130 plus years, nearly 140 years, there's been a suspicion. So SUMA um, is entirely owned by its workers. It's common ownership. So the 190 members have one pound share each. So they own 190 pounds worth of the business. The business is a big business. It has an annual turnover of 55 million pounds, uh, so about these days about 65 million euros, something like that, and exports to 50 countries. So it, it's not a little business anymore. And uh, in the early days, uh, the members of SUMA thought, we don't need anybody else. We can just create this little bubble of anarchist socialism inside capitalism. And we can survive in our little bubble. We don't need any help. Um, and there were other little bubble, bubbles. So there was a, another working cooperative here, and another one there, and another one there. And they didn't really talk to each other. And in some ways, they competed with each other as well. And they conformed to the criticisms of uh, socialists in the 19th century who said that worker cooperatives were just another form of exploitation. These people were little business owners. Uh, this was nothing to do with socialism or, or solidarity. But SUMA, because of people like me, because I was a Labour Party politician, we wanted to have a union involved because we wanted to show other workers that this was a much better way of working. You know, all my life in the same business, job security for life, the wages are double the market rate. So at the moment, uh, the, the full -time, a full-time worker in SUMA would be earning, uh, let me just work this one out, it's about 45,000 euros a year. That's double 
what they would earn elsewhere. And that's because it's a, an efficient business, it's well run, and all of the profits are shared. And people sometimes say, how consumer, which is a food distribution business, it's nothing special, it's not high tech, how consumer afford to pay such wages? And it's because there are no big cars in the car park. There are no Rolls Royces and top of the range BMWs. Uh, we don't have directors who have country estates and super yachts. The money is simply shared out and any business can be run like this. Also, because SUMA members uh, self-manage themselves and each other, uh, we, the management costs are much, much lower than an ordinary business. There is no supervisory management because people organise themselves. Although, as it's got bigger, there are, you know, the coordinators are becoming a bit more like managers and that's one of the tensions. But it's, it's a great way of running a business. So we wanted to tell other people, other workers, you can do this as well. And the best way of doing that was by SUMA workers joining a union. Well, the first union we tried to join, the Transport and General Workers Union, because SUMA is a distribution business, has a fleet of 20 trucks uh, um, and uh, warehouses, so transport and general workers seemed right. They didn't want us. They said we were management. And they didn't want us in the transport branch. They, they didn't want us in the uh, distribution branch. Uh, and eventually they pushed us into a public sector branch. So we who work in, in, in a distribution business driving trucks, forklifts, weren't running a warehouse. We were sat with people who were discussing uh, public sector funding and cuts, state, state funding cuts, and things that were totally irrelevant to us. So we changed union. And we went to the food workers union, the bakers and the food workers union. And you might like to look them up. There, it's the bakers and Food Workers Union, I think it's .org, but they're a, they're a small union and they're a very radical union, very political, very, very socialist, uh, and they were great, they loved us, so we have, we have our own workplace branch, uh, the Baker's branch 247, and so we were able to have our own union meetings and sometimes people would come in who were members who didn't have a local branch and join from other businesses and join in our, our union meetings. And the relationship has been really good um, because they brought representatives from other warehouses and factories and also the Baker's Union was very good at ensuring that SUMA abided by employment rights and employment law and uh, good terms and conditions. We were already paying far more than any union agreed rates of pay, so that wasn't a problem. But sometimes workers, as pe members of, sorry, sometimes members of a workers' cooperative can feel, you know, we don't have to obey the law because we're the business owners, we can do what we want. And the, the union was very useful in that. Um, the union was also very useful in, in, in resolving arguments because, for example, if one of their members uh, had a grievance and it wasn't very important, but this person was making a lot of fuss about this grievance, the union would say, Come with me and I'll show you one of the big bread factories and I'll show you there the way they work there for half the wage you're getting. Uh, a factory where you have to be careful that you don't get your fingers chopped off in the machines, where they pay people 
when when the big bread ovens get the, it's, with the, there's like a, a belt running through the oven, so the bread goes in one end and it cooks as it goes through and comes out the other end cooked. And they're huge, they're longer than this room, much longer than this room. And sometimes they jam as the tins get jammed up. And so they don't have to turn the oven off. They will say to somebody, 50 pounds to anybody who will open the inspection hatch, get into the oven while it's on and clear the blockage. Uh, that's the way that people get treated in these bread factories. And, and so when one of our members realized how good our conditions were, they usually would say, okay, uh, this is not a real grievance, this is just a disagreement. But I used to say with the union that um, most of the time we sat on the same side of the table. They were advisors to us, um, uh, the organized union, the full-time officials. But when there was a member who they had to defend, because SUMA is an employer and people come into conflict with their employers, then we would move to opposite sides of the table and then we would be in negotiation. Um, and we had the, the Union General Secretary came to see us several times and we had the President of the British Trade Union Congress came to see us as well. He was delighted to see a worker own business. But the, and the, the Union branch itself served as a workers as a works council. So SUMA is governed by a, a, a governing assembly of all the members and from them is elected uh, a management committee of members which puts into practice what the, uh, the governing assembly, the, the business plan has decided. And then, but they have appointed from amongst the members a committee of coordinators, which is like the management, the executive. Uh, and so you, you can have a problem of self-exploitation in worker co-ops, where people drive themselves too hard and exploit themselves. So it's not a boss doing it to you, you do it together. Uh, it's, uh, I've seen that happen quite a lot. But in the, in the union meeting, members and non-members sit down as workers and say and talk about their experience as workers. And then they can talk to the coordinators, the managers, about how they're running the business. And so you, the union provided that, that third uh, part of governance for us. So because you know the, the best forms of governance are where you have three bodies which are separate. So you have like the the lawmakers. So that's like the general assembly, and then you have the managers, the executive. They carry out the laws, and then you have uh, well. The judges, so that's the Works Council, so they check that the laws being made are fair and that the executive is, is carrying them out in the way that they were intended. And so these three separate bodies are very important for healthy governance. And we had that at SUMA. So we had the union. Uh, the General Assembly, or as we call it, uh, General Meeting, and the Executive, uh, and in SUMA there were the coordinators. And two organisations in the world, and this was something that uh, Bruno Vance at CCOP taught me, have all the three of these in the same body. So this same one body is both the lawmaker the, the, the executive carrying out the laws and the judge, the judges deciding whether it's fair. Uh, one of those bodies is the Chinese Communist Party, 
and the other one is the European Commission. <laughs> Which is very funny. Anyway. Um, so that's our experience of, uh, of having a union at SUMA. And today, 75% uh, of, of SUMA workers are still union members. Now, one of the problems arises is when the union uses employment law to try and force through something that the members don't want. So this is the ultimate democracy. But when you, because we live in a world where employees need, workers need to be protected from their employers, there are employment laws which give them rights. And even in Britain, there are still some employment rights, not many, but there are some. Uh, and the union can use those laws to, for example, try and force through collective bargaining. Uh, and this has been a big argument in SUMA by using the law. And, but, but SUMA members in the General Assembly decide the wages. They decide the wages for themselves. We decide the wages for ourselves. The employer doesn't decide it for us. So the union was trying to subvert the democracy at that time uh, to force a collective bargaining process, which was pretty silly, really. It made no sense. But that's the kind of problems that you can have with a union in a fully democratic workers' cooperative. Because SUMA, you know, SUMA has no chief executive, no managing director. It's collectively organised. Um, uh, there's no, there are very few single people, single officials with any power at all in SUMA. So, what about the history of unions and cooperatives in, well, in the UK, let's talk about it first. Um, in the 19th century, there were a lot of work, a lot of a lot of workers organised um, cooperatives, uh, worker cooperatives, and local cooperative societies running cooperative shops put money into these worker cooperatives. And for one reason and another, uh, in the 19th century, the economy in Britain was hugely unstable. It went up and down and up and down. So only the big businesses survived. And lots of little businesses were put out of business every time the economy crashed. Uh, and most of these worker cooperatives failed. And then the co cooperative shops lost lots of money. Also, the trade unions at the time were putting money into worker cooperatives. And they lost a lot of money as well. So in the late 1880s, 1890, there was a resolution at the uh, National Cooperative Congress where it was decided that the cooperative shops, the cooperative societies which were owned by their customers, would not support worker cooperatives anymore and that they would directly own the factories that supplied the shops. And at about the same time, uh, the trade unions all started, one by one, deciding to stop funding worker control and worker cooperatives because they were losing money. And then in 1919, after the First World War, the New Labour Party decided that they were not going to support worker ownership. They were going to support uh, labour as uh, collectively, or, sorry, uh, organised labour, uh, collectively bargaining with employers. That was their model. And that's what then just existed. So the unions had a, had a very clear role. They represented the workers to management. So they couldn't see that they had any kind of role in a worker-owned business. How, how, how does that work? 
and they pushed, they cut themselves out of uh, having any involvement in worker cooperatives. Worker cooperatives, also the new ones in the 1970s when SUMA was started, were largely started by people who were anarchists, not socialists, and they didn't like big organised unions. They saw them as being part of the oppressive state. And, and so relations were very bad. And when I was a, when I was a, a, a Labour councillor in the 1990s, we had a big problem with uh, residential, uh, our, our homes for elderly people. Uh, the council had no money, which meant that we had to, we had to uh, sell these, these residential homes. Um, and, or, or at least we, the council could not continue to own them and manage them. So I insisted that there was an option uh, put on paper that went to full council. So the paper's options were um, sell them to a private business and then they could invest and refurbish them, uh, keep them in council ownership and find the money well, it was impossible, there was no money, close them, just close them down, and the people had to go somewhere else. And I insisted that there was a fourth option, which was to uh, encourage the workers to form workers' cooperatives and run them as worker cooperatives because they could then borrow money for the refurbishment. Well, I was denounced by the... Uh, Trade Union Council in Bradford. They called me uh, a closet capitalist. They, they said I, I, I shouldn't be in the Labour Party, I should be in the Conservative Party because all I wanted was privatisation. And, uh, uh, and there was a lot of bad feeling. And the leader of council said to me, I'm taking that option off the paper. You know, I'm not having it. Well, the homes were all sold to private owners and within two years there was not a single union member still working in them because they'd all been driven out uh, and the, the new workers were all on much lower wages and no pensions and no rights. Now, if they had stayed in council ownership then maybe the unions could have worked with the, the cooperatives to save them and make them better. But that was then, that was 25 years ago. That was the hostility that existed then. And now, the unions are very interested in worker control. Um, both the independent unions, so the industrial unions, which just represent all workers in an area, uh, like the independent uh, workers of the world, the Wobblies, we, they're very active in in, in Britain, but also some of the better old big unions like Unite, uh, which is a gigantic union, but it's now beginning to think about workers' control again uh, as, as an option. And part of the reason is because so many young people are forming cooperatives and collectives um, in all sorts of ways, um, both housing cooperatives, food cooperatives, uh, car sharing cooperatives, bicycle repair and maintenance cooperatives, bread baking cooperatives, growing cooperatives, vegetable growing cooperatives, um, especially uh, graphic design and uh, software design. Software design cooperatives are just growing everywhere all the time and they're all linked together. And I think the unions have now woken up in the UK to the need to work with people trying to gain control of their working lives and trying to gain economic democracy. Um, now, what's happening in other parts of the world? Well, in France, there has... Uh, uh, so the French national organisation is called CG Scott. And the French word for a worker cooperative is, uh, is SCOP. 
So they call them their stop. I don't know whether it's an S there, it might just be like that. Um, and for quite a few years now, the French have had a very interesting uh, initiative where many of their small businesses are unionised. In the UK, very few small businesses are unionised. It's very rare. Most of the unions are in the big, in, in the public sector, in the health service or uh, in uh, transport um, and in, in, in government, in local government. But in France, many of the small businesses are unionised. And when the owners of those small independent businesses want to retire, the union organiser, uh, it's the, the union they will mostly work with is the CGT, um, the union organiser contacts uh, CG Scott and says, we think the owner is selling. And then CG Scott send people to the factory and they say, we race there before the machines come out the gates. So our game, we have to get there before they sell the machines. And then they go and tell the owner that the owner will get more money selling it to the workers than just selling all the machines and selling the land. And the government has a, a enabled finance so that uh, business owners can be paid and then the workers pay back the loan. So they're, they're creating hundreds of new worker cooperatives a year from these the smaller businesses, which otherwise would be lost, would be closed down. And that's an example of where the unions work very closely with worker cooperatives, and there's no problem. They've never had a problem in France. Uh, And the other really interesting area is the USA uh, with unions and cooperatives. And they, they have a model called the Union Co-op. In the USA, there are not many worker cooperatives, but there are a lot of employee share ownership uh, owned businesses. There are a lot of employee owned businesses. Uh, some huge ones. Un United Airlines was 100% employee owned. Uh, so was Enron. Anybody remember Enron? Of course. Yes. And they all lost their pensions. But it was a, more or less an, an employee owned business. But the example of Enron in United Airlines is very good because although the employees owned the shares, they owned the business as stockholders, they had no influence over the way the business was run. So the, the workers in United Airlines went on strike against their management and United Airlines went into bankruptcy and is now privately owned. And of course Enron just completely went bust because it was, it was, it was, um, a dishonest business, it was dishonest accounting. But these, uh, something like 13% of the American economy is employee owned. It's enormous, much bigger than the worker co ops. So Mondragon, uh, the, um, which most people have heard of, They, they are a, a big network of uh, industrial cooperatives in the Basque region and they've existed now for 60 years and they're very big and very wealthy and they fund cooperative development around the world and they, Montreal USA, have been working with uh, uh, employee-owned businesses in the USA 
to develop what they call the union co-op model. So, and it's the same as this three. So they have the AGM of shareholders, the annual general meeting of shareholders, and then they have um, the executive, and then they have the union. How like Zuma? It's like we've invented the same thing. So the employees meet as shareholders in the AGM and they decide on you know, business strategy. Uh, and then the employed executives, managers, are supposed to carry it out. The union represents workers' rights and acts as a works council. And the union uh, uh, negotiates with the executives um, on behalf of the AGM and the general workers. And so the union has a very important role to play in these businesses. But uh, they, are, they are worker owned. Um, it's, and they say that it's working very well. So the website is uh, one worker, one vote, dot, again, I think it's dot org. It's very interesting reading. And of course, Americans are very pragmatic. They care little about politics. So they don't have the troubles that we had in, in Britain when the unions and the worker co-op saw themselves on different sides of the political fence. They're not uh, massively in support of worker control, like they are in France, but this is just a good, pragmatic, sensible solution to the problem of businesses which are owned by their employees, who own shares and stocks, but have no influence over the management. So the, the union, using its organising experience and skills, represents the workers in, in, that, in that model. Um, anyway, have a look at what they say on oneworkeronevote.org and the, uh, the, the name of the Mondragon uh, representative in the USA is uh, Michael Peck. Which is very interesting because in Mondragon itself, those worker cooperatives are entirely owned and organised and run by the workers. They have works councils uh, to represent themselves as workers. And I, I asked them, you have no unions here? And they go, well, why do we need unions? It's a workers cooperative. And then in the USA, they work with the unions to democratise these employee-owned businesses, which is very interesting. Um, okay, I, I'm not going to talk anymore now. Uh, I, well, not just in a lecture, I, I quite like a bit of a discussion and some questions. Um, yes, please. Hi. 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 And, um, yeah, I was just all very interesting what you said. And uh, I'm kind of uh, interested to, 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 to hear something more about uh, the process of education because uh, I would say from these examples and I also know some uh, creation examples yeah. that um, um, I suppose there is no reason to have a union if you know what you're doing somewhere. Yeah. And uh, then again, of course, you need a good union and not a bad one. Yeah. So you need some kind of help to organize, basically. You know? And unions have these uh, skills and these long-term capacities. And then on, on the other side, uh, so I would say that it's like uh, maybe the, just the um, 
the issue of, uh, of who has this kind of knowledge and skills. Because this is like, uh, it, in, uh, in northern Croatia there is like a, an example of, uh, which is maybe the, the first in Croatia and the last that I know of, uh, is that uh, the people from the, uh, it's not a workers cooperative, but the cooperative, uh, social cooperative, um, called the Human Law Social Cooperative. Yeah, social yeah. yeah, they they actually uh, they asked uh, trade union from the from this part of uh, operation that they know that they know of and they know they are successful to uh, give them some kind of uh, uh, know how you know on how uh, workers councils work and you know and basically practical organizing and you know about labor act and so on. Yeah. So yeah. So how do you? I suppose when you don't need the union, then you can do it by yourselves and you have some kind of education, be it formal or informal, within the cooperative that uh, shares this kind of skills and knowledge. So how do you, how did you do it in school and right. I don't know if you can just sum up these, some of, you know, some of these okay. experiences. Yeah, well, before we had union, we just had the General Assembly and the executive the coordinators and so members sitting in the general assembly as business owners would agree business plans that the executive the coordinators would try to implement and then then the members as workers would refuse to obey you say i'm not working as hard as that and the coordinators would be saying but that's what you agreed in the general assembly so you get this kind of two-way fight when you only have two uh, centers of power. And in the American example, uh, the annual general meeting of shareholders, the executive, the chief executive, you know, would present the plan and would say, that's the plan. You say you vote for it or we all resign. Uh, so it was, so in, in the annual general meeting of shareholders, the employee owners would, would be disorganized and would sit there thinking, well, if they all resign, the business will collapse. So I better vote for it. So they would agree business plans, which then uh, were bad for the workers, for the, for the owners as workers. Having this three uh, having, having these three centres of power independent of each other, but dependent on each other, means that there's some scrutiny of what the, the General Assembly and the management are doing. Uh, it's just a general rule, that. I mean, this is a general theory of governance. And in SUMA, it happened by chance. You know, the union became the place. The union started in SUMA because uh, in a cooperative, the group can become a mob and people can become victimized because of all sorts of reasons. Um, and those individuals, they need to be protected. So people were union members in SUMA, but as individuals, being before we had an official union, and it was also very useful for me as a personnel officer to be able to say to the other members, well, the union says that if we do this, it's going to cost us an enormous amount of money. So you want to sack those two, three people because you don't like them. No other reason. You members have decided you don't like those three people. Well, they have rights. And the union says they would their union says uh, uh, that uh, it will cost Zuma a lot of money. So do you still want to do that? It was very useful as, as a way of negotiating with the members. Um, now I quite agree that some unions are terrible. So the first union we had, Transport General Workers Union, was bad, really bad. Not interested at all. It was just all they wanted to do was negotiate with management uh, and kind of make deals with management. And 
often the deal was management would say, well, we want to get rid of a third of the workforce, um, but we'll give the two thirds to remain a wage rise. So we want you as the union to help us make that happen. Very much to negotiate uh, deals and contracts with management. Uh, that's their major role. And so in this American model, the, this, is, is, this is built into the union co-op model. But unlike most businesses, um, all of this is done democratically. So it's all under the control of the General Assembly, the annual general meeting of shareholders. Uh, but the, the union can uh, do political education in, in this structure to ensure that the shareholders understand that being a worker cooperative member, you have to be uh, a business owner, you often have to be a manager, uh, you have to be a member of a cooperative and take part in the cooperative. You have to be, in, in the UK, an, a, a legal employee with a formal relationship with your employer, which is the cooperative, and you have to be a worker. So you have to wear five hats. And people say, oh, it's too complicated. But that's what we do in our normal lives, you know, with our friends and with our family. You know, we are we go from one thing to another. You know, we we go from you know, friends to brother to son to father to you know whatever. And we don't see a problem in changing all those roles. We just do it. And in in working cooperatives, people but so sorry, in businesses people have been dumbed down into thinking I am just an employee. I just do the work and that's it, that's where it ends. And they've been indoctrinated into believing that. And one of the issues in working cooperatives is choosing people who are unhappy with just being a flesh and blood robot working on the production line. And you want to be more than that, um, but also not letting people slip back into the easy life, which is I work, my shift, and then I go home and I don't think about anything else. And then I come back next morning and I do another shift. You can't run a worker cooperative like that. Even one which has a formal uh, ex executive management structure. So in the American model, the union uh, educate their union members and the stockholders in how to deal with the executive management. So they can't run the business for their purposes. Um, you know, do you know the, the, agent, the agent principal problem? That all organisations get taken over by their managers who then run the organisation for their own benefit. And it doesn't matter whether they're democratic or hierarchical or whatever, the managers always take over and the top managers always take over. So you get runaway chief executive salaries and in the UK at the moment there's a big row about the university chief executives uh, getting paid enormous amounts of money, more than company chief executives, because they can't. So, meanwhile, the students' courses are, the, are being stripped, stripped of all quality uh, to, to fund the top management pay. And that, that, that process happens, it happens in investor-owned businesses, it happens in cooperatives, it happens in state-owned businesses, it happens everywhere. And the only way you can stop it is by having informed workers who will resist. So in Mondragon, the, uh, in the Mondragon cooperatives, the pay ratio between the chief executive 
and the lowest paid worker is uh, nine to one. Uh, so, Montreal own the third biggest bank in Spain. Bank chief executives are usually paid millions and millions of euros a year in salary. The chief executive of the Montreal Bank earns a hundred, no, was it? 200,000 euros a year. And it's, it's nothing for a bank chief executive. Um, I think it's that. It's still working on now. Yeah, it is, that's right, yeah, that's right. And he was asked in an interview, when, you, when you're meeting with the chief executives of other big European banks, and you're earning one-tenth what they're earning, uh, or less, how do you feel? And he says, well, I, I'm okay with this, because I know that when I go back to Mondragon, all, my all, all the people who work in our bank are my friends, and I have a community, and I will live in that community, and I will be supported, and people will appreciate what I've done in the bank. Whereas all these other chief executives are hated, and have to go and buy private islands to go and live on and be miserable on, because all their employees and all their customers hate them. There's been money-grabbing gangsters. So, but that's, that's a good example in Montreal because they have worker power, they can stop their executives taking over. And in Sumer, we, we do it by not, not really having executives and also having equal pay. Everybody in Sumer is paid the same pay rate. It doesn't matter who you are. And in fact, the highest paid people in Sumer are the students who come to work in the, in the summer because they don't pay any tax. Because they only work in the summer, they don't pay any tax. So what they earn in the summer and take home is higher than anybody else. Which is a bit strange. Okay, thanks. That was a good question and I went on too long answering it. Does anybody else want to ask? Yes. Well, you asked the fellow about Suma, that everybody gets paid the same, yeah. same wages. I mean, how does it function? I mean, have people, some of the people be satisfied with it because they think, okay, I'm doing I'm more complex work or I, I, have educate, I have educated myself more or something like that, and then they think, okay, I deserve to get paid a little bit more than somebody who is. Okay. Uh, well, one thing I've learned in life is that I think I'm a clever person. Uh, I think I'm an intellectual, and I can do complicated thinking and complicated analysis, but I can't work as hard as someone who's an experienced manual worker. So, who's, who's producing the value? Is it me doing the analysis, or is it them doing the work? Can't decide. Um, but also at Suma, people do a variety of jobs. So I would be personnel officer two days a week. Uh, I only worked three days a week for a long time because I was doing other things, uh, politics and cooperative support and other cops. So I would be doing per uh, personnel officer two days a week, which is very difficult, it made my head hurt. And then the third day a week, I'd be working in the warehouse, and driving a forklift truck, and it was great because I'd go from head work to hand work, and then back again. And is it something that is usual in Suma? I mean, for yeah, most of the workers, it is, do it's, you actually swap, swap your... Uh, yeah, it's called basis. policy. Uh, so it is yeah. a policy. Yeah, there are three areas. So there's the warehouse, the office, and uh, driving the trucks. And Suma members have to work in two of those three areas. Uh, but then that's very useful because, for example, if you're somebody who uh, had little education and you you you're, you learn to drive a truck and maybe a forklift truck in the warehouse as well, um, especially driving trucks, uh, the, the sort of 
deliveries that the drivers at SUMA do. So they might be doing 18 deliveries a day and they're jumping in and out of the truck and they're carrying sacks and boxes. It's very heavy work. Um, and really, uh, when you get past your, your mid-40s, it's difficult. And if you're doing it all the time, you, you don't survive. You have to give up doing it. Uh, it's, it's physically too difficult. But if you're, if you're at SUMA, you can learn to do a desk job and sit down at a computer for one or two days a week and have a rest and then go back out and drive trucks and carry big boxes and sacks around. So people get to do what they want for longer. Now people say, well there are some jobs you just can't do them. You need a PhD in electronic engineering. So uh, those people are, are rare and they can demand uh, high salaries. That's true. But there are other ways of organising work, um, saying, uh, well, for example, finance director. The, the finance director of a business like Sumo would be earning oh, possibly 200,000 euros a year as a salary uh, because it's quite a big business. Um, now, there's no way we would pay it, Sumo would pay anybody that amount of money. So the Zuma way of doing it is to get maybe four people doing that job, sharing it, helping each other, watching each other to make sure there's nothing funny going on because finance directors, um, CCOP did a study in uh, 2005, six of the reasons why worker co-ops cease to be worker co-ops and become privately owned. Uh, and they found that in the majority of cases it was because the finance manager had taken them over and turned them into a private business. Finance managers are dangerous people because they know how to do it in a way that they can hide what they're doing from the rest of, of the, the workers and the rest of the managers. And that's why as soon as we did not want the finance director only add something. Usually, uh, in this classical, I don't know, economic theory or mm. business theory, they say that financial part of the business has to be centralized and it has to be centralized through usually one, this one person who is a financial director, and that that person has a lot of responsibility, and then that person should get paid a lot, much more than uh, than the rest of the, the workers because of that responsibility and skills and blah blah blah. And then you say that in SUMA you have a couple of people who are actually sharing that yeah. responsibility of financial directing. And my question would be, okay, so I suppose it functions because SUMA is a really uh, successful cop. Yeah. But in, in your opinion, uh, how good does it function and uh, what do you think, why is it functioning that well? Uh, because we use multiple intelligence. If you have four people sharing a job, you have four times the intelligence of one person. And even if that one person is super clever, you've at least got double the intelligence. Um, you have double the creativity. But you know, you were saying that in, in classical management theory, you centralise financial control. Well, then you would say that in a capitalist economy because the job of the financial part of the business is to get all the value created out of the business and into the hands of the investors or into the hands of the senior executives. So you don't want um, all the workers understanding finance, knowing the numbers and being able to uh, understand that there is profit grabbing going on here. You want the workers to be told the story Oh, it's very difficult, you know, we're, 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 we're struggling, uh, we can't pay you a wage rise, uh, you're all going to have to work harder, we're stopping recruitment, uh, times are hard. That's what you want them to believe. Meanwhile, the senior executives are just pulling money out of the business as fast as they can.
and in the UK, and I'm sure they do it in Croatia as well, loading it up with debt, borrowing money, which they're taking out of the business, and loading it up with debt because they don't intend to be there for much longer. And as soon as it crashes, they're gone with their money. They have no loyalty anymore, executives. Um, I don't know if you heard about it, but a big company in Britain, Carillion, went bust. And they had a huge number of very big government contracts. They, uh, they did all sorts of things, but mainly building, building buildings. They didn't actually do the building. They got the contract, and then they uh, got loads of contractors to come and work for them under the brand name Carillion. So everybody thought Carillion was the builder, but it wasn't. It was just a sort of middleman. Um, but what they were doing, they were getting the money from the government, putting it out on the money markets and speculating with it uh, to make hidden profits. And, it, and the model worked because they were then getting all those profits and taking them out. Uh, and they were not paying the small contractors for months. So the small contractors couldn't pay their workers uh, while the Carillion executives were speculating and gambling with the money. Well, it all went wrong and they lost a load of money and the whole business just collapsed suddenly. Uh, I think 400 million pounds loss just came out of nowhere. Now, that's the way executives behave. And you don't want anybody having that kind of power in any kind of worker-owned or, or worker-controlled business. I mean, there are businesses, um, you may well have heard of uh, John Lewis. This uh, big, uh, business of uh, big stores and supermarkets. Um, so uh, I think you know, 12 billion pound turnover business. And they have a hundred thousand employees, so it's a big business. Um, it's often described as being employee owned. John Lewis is actually owned by a, another organisation, a trust. Uh, the original owner, who was John Lewis, uh, after the First World War, was so scared of the Communist Revolution and the workers arising and taking the business that he formed a trust and he gave his business to the trust. And the only purpose of the trust is to run the business for the benefit of the workers. And so they, they have some access to knowledge of what's going on in the business and they have some say in how the management run the business but they don't have rights to that knowledge and they don't have a right to tell the management how the business is run so but in the capitalist world you know the the capitalist class is always trying to find ways of saying Oh, well, you've got worker control. John Lewis, that, that's worker control. No, it's not. And they, in, in the UK, they have been heavily promoting and developing employee-owned businesses which have professional executive management where the workers are not organised and, uh, and don't really know what's going on. So although formally... They are the owners of the business because they don't know what's going on. They can't control it, so they're not the owners. You know, an accountant would say to you, uh, how do you work out who the owner of the business is? Well, it's the entity that controls the disposal of the assets. So if you have a business that's deeply in debt to the banks, the banks are the owner, not, not the the name on the chief executive's door, or, the, or, or, or even the investors. Please. Is there anyone else? No, I actually wanted to ask you, uh, in the first place, this, what about this, uh, these cases where what you were now saying, that uh, 
that are really common in Croatia that uh, people maybe want to start or they get in the situation that they are there and they are on their own and they have to run something and start yeah. over or something like that. And of course because of that uh, previous indoctrination, people are very often uh, scared or uh, they don't want to ask more for themselves or something like that. And uh, I understand that there is good to have a union then to yeah. try to make this, uh, yeah, to, 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 yeah, to, to, to give this, to give that perspective as well. But uh, now when you were saying also about this process in Suma, I suppose there was a process now, people understanding collectively that uh, maybe it's good uh, for them to work on two places and not only on one, in order to avoid this kind of situation of getting stuck somewhere or yeah. or making uh, making very big uh, yeah, walls uh, uh, yeah. around three uh, groups of people. Yeah. So, uh, just I'm interested uh, on you know, what are the... For instance, if someone new came into Suma now, yeah. And it has like 40 years of experience and all these procedures built on that experience. How do you get that person into this uh, collective? You know, how, how do you make him or her understand, you know, what, you know, how to ask for, you know? Okay. Yeah, well, um, 25 years ago, Suma was in a mess because people were just uh, getting their friends in. You know, as the business grew, it was, we need more people. And somebody would say, oh, I've got a friend who would like to work here. Okay, ask your friend to come. And then, you know, my, my first day at Suma, I literally walked through the front door and said, have you got any work? And uh, one of the members who was walking past at the time just said, ask Louise. And I went over to Louise and said, I'm new, can you tell me what to do? And Louise told me how to work in the warehouse. And that was it. And I was in. Um, and, you know, uh, if I took time off to go on holiday, you'd have to start again. Because they'd go, oh, I thought you'd left. You haven't seen him for two weeks. <laughs> it was so informal. But the problem is that all sorts of people who just wanted money and didn't want to work realised that this was a great place because they could come and just hang around and get paid for leaning against the wall, smoking. You know? uh, and so we had to change and we had to change. Um, we decided we were going to start employing people who wanted to be a cooperative member on the grounds that it's easier to train a cooperative member to drive a delivery truck than to uh, train a delivery truck driver to be a cooperative member. So we got we chose people who were already interested and had some evidence that they had tried to work collectively, cooperatively before they came. They worked very well. Um, but I, I do understand that there are businesses where you just can't do that. So Delta T Electronics, who make, um, in Cambridge, who make measuring devices, uh, they do require PhD electronic engineers. Uh, and they, they can't work the same way as Zoom does. Yeah, yeah please. Tell us a lot about the, the role of the unions. Yes. Uh, mediating between the executives and the general assemblies. Yeah. But have you had experiences at SUMA where, and you, and you also mentioned that unions at some point try to impose the senseless uh, situation of the, the collective bar bargaining yes. while at the other hand you have the internal democracy. Yes. Uh, which is fine because you do, you, since you have a flat flat pay and uh, and a high pay, higher pay, Yes. pay than the other companies is a bit senseless. But have you had situations where the unions actually, either by imposing a law or by just uh, that you are overexploiting your, yourself or putting in yourself as workers, 
in a, in a disabled position? Yes, the, the union did say that uh, health and safety at CIMO was not good enough. Mm -hmm. It was poor. Um, we were also told by public health officials that the health and safety procedures at SUMA were poor and it was dangerous work because people were not working safely. So that was very useful because then you know, uh, I was responsible for health and safety and I was able to say to members, both the union and uh, public health officials have told us that this is unsafe. We, we have to change. So that was very useful that, that they used the law in that situation to say that we were putting workers at risk unnecessarily. Um, I mean, there have been examples in the past where unions have come into conflict over worker control. Uh, in the 1970s, um, the British motorcycle industry was collapsing because the Japanese were taking over everything. Uh, the, the Japanese motorcycles were much more popular. Uh, the British motorcycles were very old fashioned and nobody wanted to buy them. So they were closing factories and consolidating businesses. And there were there were two factories left. There was a, a Triumph factory in Meriden and then there was um, uh, Norton Villiers Triumph, so not really something or a factory in in not that far away, so they were quite close together, but they were different unions. So the the, the Triumph factory was the transport of German workers, and the other factory was the engineering union. And uh, the Labour government of the time uh, supported the workers in the Triumph factory take it over as a worker cooperative. Uh, and that caused a lot of anger between the two unions because the engineering union said keeping that factory open is threatening our members' jobs. It, it's an ancient factory making an old, obsolete product. It should be allowed to close. Um, so that also said so, and that unions don't like fighting with each other. They, they, they really dislike that. Um, and so that caused a lot of bad feeling. And it was another reason why it was then uh, an, another 40 years before the unions seriously started looking at workers' control again in Britain. Um, I mean, unions are. They're creatures of capitalism. You know, I mean, you know, they, they dance with management. They dance with the business owners. They don't like not having that business owner partner to dance with. They feel lonely and lost. And uh, find life very difficult being standalone activist representatives of the workers. And that's why the independent unions are, are, are taking over in, in Britain. You know, they, uh, like the, 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 the union at ITAS, which is not a craft union, it's not one particular um, uh, craft, like it's not an engineering union, it represents everybody. And those sorts of unions who simply represent the workers are, are now, I think, the future of unions. I think the old style of union is, is gone. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, I have two questions uh, that I believe that, that are linked. Uh, one is, what's the level of uh, union militancy in, in SUMA? Meaning, how often do the members who are working in the in the COP uh, take part in, in union meetings, um, activities, protests, and, and similar? And the other linked question is, do you know of any examples uh, where uh, cooperatives act as a safe haven for union militants that are um, being sacked or repressed from the workplace so they need to find some more friendly uh, workplace? Uh, okay. Um, 
Sumer members are frightened of being too militant. They, they, again, they try and avoid the discomfort, the disagreement. Um, um, so it was the union that said we should abide by the working time directive and that nobody at Zoom should work more than 48 hours a week. There were quite a few members of Zoom who wanted to work more than that. They wanted to. They wanted to earn the money. And they were very annoyed that the union had proposed, or members had proposed, that the court policy should be that everybody sticks to 48 hour a week maximum, that's like six days work. Um, you can actually get it up to about 55 hours a week by playing around with the regulations legally. But, and, and so there were, there were some, some union members resigned over that issue. They said the union's not here to stop me earning as much as I can while I can. Um, so that was an example of that. The and uh, yeah, I mean, I there was a there was a senior member who was a very he was a, a very active militant miner in the National Union of Mine Workers who was uh, victimised and. Uh, pushed out of uh, the industry. Um, he, I mean, he fell out with the other NUM people. And he then became a student member. And I, I know of other co-ops where union activists have, uh, have found a new way of expressing their, their desire for worker solidarity. Because that's what it's about. I mean, it's about workers collecting together and working together and as Suma motto is let's just get this right represents the workers. Now, I, I would say that really, you need to keep a link with the shop floor. You need to carry on understanding what it's like to work on the shop floor if you're going to represent people. And that's what you can do in 
know, working cooperative, you can maintain that link and understanding. You know, it would be easy for me if I had stopped working on the warehouse um, in uh, 1994 when I became a personnel officer to think that the senior warehouse was still like it was then and be going, what's the problem? Why are you complaining? It's a nice place to work. Well, you know, it's a completely different place to work now. But because I continued to work in it, I, I got that understanding when people were complaining. You know, the work intensity is too high, there's too many people, there's too much work. <laughs> so, um, and of course, the internet and social media has changed a lot of this um, because people are now so it's much more it's much easier to organise now with with social media. You can have you know private private groups uh, so that um, workers can talk to each other. Um, the idea that uh, management have total control over a business is gone now because uh, workers um, tell each other what's going on um, and we found in SUMA that um, some of our workers, uh, particularly delivery drivers who have very close relationships with their customers, were in social media groups with their customers and telling their customers what was happening inside SUMA. So you go, whoa, that's, that's not allowed, isn't it? That's, that's a disciplinary offence, isn't it? Well, it's impossible to police now. So the boundary around the business has disappeared. And it's just this sort of network of relationships and communications going on now. But it has the advantage that when you're an Uber, you can you can get together with other Uber drivers without Uber knowing, and to discuss how they're cheating you, and uh, you know, tell the other Uber drivers, watch out, uh, this is a trick they're playing on us, and and then working with the union, so unites the union are working with Uber drivers in the UK, uh, organising them, and. Uh, Get, trying to get to form cooperatives. So in the USA, uh, quite a few cities have uh, refused to license Uber. I think um, Austin, Texas was the first one, and the drivers got their own taxi hailing app. And so now there is no Uber in, in Austin, in Texas, because the taxi drivers do it themselves and they keep the 10, 15, 20% that Uber were raking off from the fares. So it, it, is, it is easy now to organise. And the unions, unions and worker corps have to, have to go with that. Do you have any, uh, an example where, maybe some country where there is no so such tension between unions and cooperatives, and they are working together. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, Sweden. I. Uh, oh, what's his name? The guy at Seacock from Sweden. Olsen, Jan Olsen. Do you know Jan? Jan Olsen. Yeah. I once said to Jan, why do we never hear about strikes uh, in, in Sweden? There must be strikes in Sweden, there must be industrial unrest. And he said, well, most of the time, um, the unions and the employers uh, sit down at the table with a local representative, so three again, we just come to an agreement. We all live in the same country. Nobody wants to cheat anybody. It's only the foreign employers that cause trouble. <laughs> and you think, yes, that would be lovely. Wouldn't life be great if we could do that? Because in the UK, being a very class-based society, 
you know, you're either you're either in the working class or in the management ruling class, and people move between those classes. So you can have somebody who's a good workers' representative who defends the rights of working people, and then they get into a union management position, and you assume they're still working class, but no, they've got other interests now. It's much more important to defend their job and their personal interests with the other managers to make sure that they, their rights aren't threatened. Um, and unfortunately, you know, people, uh, you know, the, the, the relationship in capitalism is um, is that you are either a master or a servant. And everybody has to choose. And sometimes you can, you know, in some situations people will be a master in some situations, like middle management will be masters over the work, over the shop floor, but then the servants of higher management. But people always have to decide all the time. In this situation, am I a master or am I a servant? Well, what we say in a worker cooperative is that you are both. And sometimes, so, sometimes you go more to doing as you're told by other people, and sometimes you go more to coordinating what other people are doing. So when I was a personnel officer, I had a lot of influence in organising how things happened. But on Friday, when I worked in the warehouse, I was a, a temporary worker in the warehouse and the people who were in the warehouse along with me told me what to do. And it was fine, it was no problem. You know, but but sometimes so but this this is one of those things that neoliberal thinking and hierarchical thinking does. It puts everything into this dualism, this is, uh, bipolar. You have to be one thing all the other. And human beings aren't like that. There's almost nothing in, in human life which is one thing or the other. People tend to be a mixture. They might go more towards one end than the other, but everybody's a mixture. And, um, and fighting that is really difficult in worker cops because you get people who say, I just want to work. You know, I don't want to hurt my brain thinking about management. I don't want to worry. You know, this is all new to me. I'm a good worker. I just want to work like a, like a horse. You know, the, the uh, animal farm. Uh, George Orwell's animal farm. The, the car horse says, I don't want to think. I just want to work. And the car horse works and works and works until he kills himself from overwork. Uh, Meanwhile, the pigs have become the masters in animal farm, and uh, so and one of the, one in, in a worker cooperative, it can be very difficult because you get people who come in who usually who are used to telling other people what to do. They've been trained to do it. They've been to private schools where they're taught how to be masters in in clever ways as well. So not like in the army about giving orders just by having great confidence and charm and uh, knowing how to get people to do what they want them to do. Uh, and, and those people slide into the master positions and you just, you just see uh, cooperatives being taken over. And I know a co-op where allegedly they're all equal all of the people in the responsible positions have been to private school. Uh, uh, and I go, so how did that happen? And they go, I don't know. You know they just seem to work their way into those positions because they assumed they were masters, they were on the top. So it's, it's also about psychology as well, you know, trying to deal with that. Um, Okay, that was
terms of long run, went off over there somewhere. <laughs> I remember uh, the, the different societies. So Americans tend not to think of things in terms of class. So they tend not to have a, a, a ruling class and a working class in America. Uh, in, it's just who's rich and who's not. Um, but the idea is that anybody can do it. Uh, so their, their pragmatic way of dealing with, with uh, unions and co-ops is just brilliant and I I was in South Africa uh, and uh, I was talking they, South, the um, Durban City Council had set up quite a lot of co-ops well they called them co-ops but they weren't but they, they I, I was asked to come and talk to people because they were having a lot of problems and uh, one of the problems was that whenever there were any men in these co-ops, they ran. The only ones that uh, had any influence by women were the all women co-ops. And they would say, we don't want any men, because they'll just take over. But the other thing was uh, that, uh, I said, well, why do you let them take over? You know, there's only one man, ten women, tell him he's not going to be the boss. Uh, well, the you know, local culture, that was very difficult. But what was interesting was that we were in a room and uh, yeah, there was uh, an interpreter interpreting for me because people were speaking Zulu and Hosa and most of them weren't speaking English. And there's a lot of talking going on and it's quite difficult to work out what people are talking about. And then this, uh, this man started talking, everybody went silent just listen to him, and I don't know what language he was talking in, I think he was talking in Zulu, and, uh, and then he stopped talking, everybody started talking again, and afterwards I said, so who was he? And he said, oh, he's a chief, so he has status. I said, so do you obey the chiefs? And he goes, oh no, we just listen to them, and then we ignore them. <laughs> so it's a different kind of class society. You know, he's a traditional chief. By you know, he inherited the role from his father. So, so. but it's just a different. You know, different societies do it in different ways. Uh, I remember a campaign in the workers' Cup in North America. It was there is no bosses here. Mm. Remember? No. Yeah, no boss. No. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's the Bay Area Workers' Cops. Yeah, and they call it N O B A W C, no boss.